My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome back to another episode of FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens, of course, 24-7. Today, we're going to talk about a really cool topic, which is one of my faves, unexpected entrepreneurship, and we're going to mix it up with sleep science and napping all favorite topics of mine. And we're gonna do that with my guest, Dr. Catherine Ham. Now, Catherine Ham is the founder and CEO of Barabi, a New York-based sleep aid company with the mission to make natural sleep available to everyone. By combining sleep science with functional design, Barabi has created a new type of weighted blanket made from nothing other than sustainable tree fabrics. Now, what's really cool about this is Catherine, it's not like she started her career in sleep science. No, she got a PhD in economics from, let's see if I can say this right, Universität Witten Hedeke, I believe that is in Germany, and she was an economist at the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank, before starting Barabi because she was traveling around the world all the time and she couldn't sleep. And so I just love the fact that she solved her own problem, found a better way to do things in the weighted blanket industry, and has built this company that is burgeoning. I mean, they are in major retailers across the country, places like Pottery Barn and West Elm. And by the way, Catherine was so nice. She actually sent me one of her blankets. And I have to say, I knew nothing of this weighted blanket thing. It's like seeing the matrix. (laughs) I had a dream the first night. I dreamt so deep that I had two separate dreams about my childhood dog, he hasn't been around since about 1994 and it was crazy and it was very restful. So I I have no sort of economic interest here in this thing, but I got to tell you the weight of blanket thing, it's, it's real. So (laughs) just, whoa. Um, now on this episode, you're going to learn a bunch of really cool things. First of all, you're going to learn how to deal with disorientation. You can feel when you are starting a company or an entrepreneurial venture and leaving behind a very prestigious and safe job, like something uh, that, she, that Catherine did at the World Bank. We're going to talk about how you could potentially get really big companies, retailers interested in working with you, even when you're a tiny little startup. We're going to talk about how you can build the knowledge you need to actually innovate and be an entrepreneur in an industry where maybe you don't have the, the quote unquote expertise. And we're also talk about why Catherine has created a culture of napping at her company and why naps matter. And as regular listeners know, I am, am a napper, uh, for many years. And I love naps. I started in high school. So anything that can get napping into the culture of a, of our world and our business world, I'm a big fan of that. And in fact, my small ass this week is a really easy one. Go take a nap. Just take a nap. It'll be good for you. All right. And now onto the interview. So as you know, I like to start every interview with the same question. And I, of course, asked Catherine exactly the same as always. I started our conversation by asking her, what's the most important decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? Founding my company. And I think for the most important decision was actually getting off the ground when I emptied out all my retirement savings to get the company started in the first place. Okay, let's dig into that a little bit. So did you, what were you doing before you decided to found your company? So I used to work uh, at the World Bank as an economist. Um, so really no entrepreneurial background or um, intentions, I would say. I had just kind of moved from uh, Washington um, to India, and I always was a light sleeper, even as a kid. So but when I was um, kind of traveling like all across South Asia, either by tuk-tuk on a road, on airplane in Bangladesh, Bhutan, uh, I developed chronic uh, insomnia. So I mean, like just not being able to fall asleep, waking up multiple times at night, and then just kind of waking up in the morning when it feels like you you didn't sleep at all. So it started really affecting me on a deeper level. It's not where, you know, it's kind of just affected my work, affected me as a a person. 
um, in my in my personal life. And at that point, I was looking just like literally for anything that could help me sleep better. Um, and I guess you go down the road of looking at like different products, mattress, pillow, mattresses, pillows, white noise machines, and nothing really helped. And um, then I came across like a an article, like a medical article that I read where they talked about these heavy blankets it was the first time that I actually heard about them. And in that article, it was um, and it was about um, how these heavy blankets and when you put an evenly distributed weight on your body, how it helps with sensory disorders and autism. But basically, on the end of the article, there was a small sentence that the same mechanism potentially could also help adults sleep better. And I was like, OK, I, I don't have anything to lose at that stage. I tried basically everything. And I ordered one of these weighted blankets from a German pharmacy, um, a specialty store, because at that point it was such a medical niche product that you just couldn't order it online. It took six weeks to come. And uh, it was really one of these ugly orange on one side, blue on the other side, um, not really great fabrics filled with plastic beads, but it was like incredible how it made me sleep. I tested it on a Saturday afternoon and I slept for four hours just on a nap, like just napping for four hours, which never happened to me before. And that was the end of the point where I'm like, okay, I need this product. Um, and I thought also at that point, like that now I, all my sleep problems are solved. I'm just using that weighted blanket and I can move on with my life. Um, but then just kind of the night, the next night, I kicked it off the bed because it was just simply too hot. Um, and then obviously it makes sense because if you have 20 pounds of plastic beads on your body, there's just no way to have a breathable or kind of comfortable sleep experience. And at that point I started looking and I thought, okay, this product has been out since more than 30 years. It's not that I invented weighted blankets. Someone must have done something about it or, you know, kind of taken the next step of innovation. It turned out nobody actually had done anything. And that kind of was the start of Barbie as a company, just that realization that there was no solution out there um, for a better product. It's amazing. It's amazing how I love that that you're I can only imagine you're traveling around the world and and you don't know this about me, but I'm actually a consultant to the World Bank. So I, I know a lot about the World Bank and I know how you're like constantly jet lagged. Every time I go on a trip to Africa or Asia, it's like you're in Bangladesh and you can't sleep and and you're working really hard and it messes with your system. And then you see this article and you're like, hmm, and it comes from your homeland of Germany. So it's like almost perfect that you sort of are tied into this whole thing. Now the thing is though, about the World Bank, love the World Bank. People at the World Bank are not risk takers. Like the, it is a place where you go, you stay for your career. You're an economist, so you're, you know, you, you're like a very, you know the numbers and how they work and what percentage of businesses fail. But you start a company and you empty out your savings. So tell us, like, how did you decide? I mean, that's I imagine that was quite radical for you to have done. So how did you decide to go from like, hey, this is an awesome, like I laid down for four. I would have slept for like four days, by the way. But you go from that <laughs> point to deciding to just like jump in. It's actually funny that you bring that up because once I, um, once I had um, kind of handed in my resignation, the HR department of the World Bank, kind of because no one resigns from the World Bank, they're like, but are you retiring or are you leaving the World Bank? I'm like, no, I'm not, <laughs> I'm so not retiring. I'm really, I'm really leaving because really nobody leaves. So I think at the beginning, I thought more about it as a project. Um, and I always uh, also thought if this doesn't work out, um, I just come back. And so I kind of did the math. And I was like, I give myself a year to get it off the ground. And then if it doesn't work out, I, that's at least to have a good learning experience. And then, I mean, at that point, I was also working a lot um, on the entrepreneurial side with SMEs. So I was like, it will small help and medium me enterprises job. for those of you who small don't know and, the term. Yeah, exactly. Small and medium enterprises. And we're trying to get loans. Um, so understanding them better. So I had worked a lot in that sector. So I saw it more as a case study at the beginning. I went very meth we had kind of like by the books, you know, filing a patent, getting the product a prototype of the ground, finding manufacturing, kind of as you would do in a business plan. And I gave myself a year to do that. And um, yeah, so I gave myself that year. So if I haven't been back, 
Um, but it was kind of that initial like moment. If you if you don't do it fully and kind of plan it out, I think then I probably wouldn't have left. Did people? I'm, I imagine people did say to you like, "Are you crazy? Should you? You know, how did you? What did people say to you? And then how did you sort of, I guess, overcome the doubters?" Yeah, I mean, I think one thing is obviously when when you're in your twenties and you have like a, a start and you start a startup, then everyone congratulates you and says, "Wow, that's amazing," and there are kind of no questions asked. But when you're in the mid of your career, and you also kind of studied, I have a PhD in economics, so I I studied for quite some time, and then you kind of like change your career mid trajectory to something you don't have any experience. Uh, and I'm, you're telling people while I'm selling now heavy blankets on the internet. <laughs> it's like, I mean, the reactions are pretty obvious. People were like, oh, maybe she's in some kind of like crisis, midlife crisis. But yeah, there was definitely not not a much of like uh, support or understanding in my kind of immediate circle. Um, and also at the beginning, when you bootstrap, you don't have anything to show, right? You can't say, well, I have these amazing investors. I raised millions of dollars. You don't even have a website that you can show people. So that's like, I would say the first year when you're working all by yourself on that prototype and like iterating and you have to also kind of your whole identity collapses, you know, before the first thing that people always ask is what do you do? And it, I always had a very simple answer, like, well, I work for the World Bank. Most people know. So no more questions asked. Now it became much more complicated. I'm like, well, I'm like kind of sort of doing this. So and I think it's, it's um, kind of not exposing yourself too much to that early criticism and having that timeline in your mind. I think that's so important. So I'm like, OK, I can take this for one more year. So you get kind of all the negative feedback. But then I think like putting that fixed deadline, which was like a year for me, and then you just kind of you're a bit in a tunnel vision where you're like, okay, I can take all these things for a year, just bring it on. Um, I think that's really important, or at least that helped me of kind of like blending out all these negative voices that I got. FOMO. FOMO. You make a really good point there, and one that I've talked about in the past, which is the identity bit. Like people think, you know, the hard part of being an entrepreneur is like, well. I can't predict my earnings or I could fail or I have to work really hard. And yeah, those are hard parts. But there's this part, especially for somebody like you who went and got a PhD, you're working at the World Bank, which like, you know, that's very prestigious and you're staying in the nice hotels and and you're meeting with finance ministers of countries. And, you know, it's a really prestigious role. And then you go from that to you basically like you have your business card with the, your brand you've just made up and people are like, you've got it on moo.com and people are like, well, okay then. And so it is when I left my wall street job, you know, you know, I was like, well, I'm in private equity. I thought I was quite, quite an important guy. And then you're like figuring it out. People definitely, you know, they, they do look at you like, Oh wow, it's kind of sad. Like I wouldn't want to be in his shoes. Like, Oh, that's terrible. And so it, that can be very disorienting because it's one thing if you have like nothing to lose and you've like, you know, you're you sort of like either you've made a lot of money and so it's like, well, who cares? Or you're just kind of starting out in your career and so you're like, well, whatever, you know, I, I haven't done anything quite yet. But if you, you are in the middle stage there where you have like a very solid career and a path and an identity, it can be extraordinarily disorienting. Thankfully, you stuck it out. So tell us now, where is the company today? What's going on with Bear? Because I was Googling a little bit and I see they sell your blankets everywhere. Pottery Barn and other, I was like, whoa, this is, it's like seeing the matrix, you're everywhere. So how big is the company? What are your sort of products today and, and where are you taking the company? Yeah, I mean, we are, um, we got approached quite early on by retailers. So West Ham reached out after just, um, I think four months in business where it was like, that must be, you know, some fake email. <laughs> and the buyer was asking, like, I want to see your blankets. We've been looking for sustainable product and we were looking into weighted blankets. Can we come to your showroom? And at that point, we were like two people working out of my living room. So we're like, oh, let us come to your place. Um, so that happened quite early. And then nine months later, we were um, in West Elm and then also now in Pottery Barn and exclusively at um, William Sonoma as their partner. And we just launched three weeks ago in Nordstrom. And then from like these two people in my living room, we're now almost 30 people. Um, we had more than 20 million revenue last year. We're about to double this year. 
so it's been yeah it's been quite a ride uh for the company um and yeah building it during covid um onboarding people um onboarding all these uh, retailers and at the same time building our d2c channel so yeah it, it's it's been wild uh, it's been but it's yeah it's been also very uh very exciting what is it about your product that gets because like you hear these stories about entrepreneurs knocking on the doors. I have a really good friend called Michelle Levy. She had this shoe company called Melissa and she lives in New York. And I would see her like walking around Soho with a bag of shoes, like knocking on retailers doors to get her clients, which she did very successfully. And she's amazing. But, you know, at some point people start calling you. You had that kind of early on. Like the West Elm is, I mean, that's a real company, right? So like, what was it about your product that was so appealing to them? I mean, I think that if you know about like traditionally weighted blankets, they're like these medical like gray blankets that are filled with plastic beads. It's something you don't really want to put on your couch in the in the living room. So by kind of just removing the plastic and making it like a chunky knit weighted blanket that's just made out of organic layers of cotton, it just looks beautiful. It's something that suddenly you want to keep on your couch and that also Western wants to display on your couch and you can have seasonal colors and it becomes from that kind of ugly sleep aid suddenly it becomes like this beautiful home decor item that people are like look I want to show you my weighted blanket and we had customers that had another one before that said whenever my friends came over I put the thing aside and was hiding it and now it becomes like that piece of home decor that people want to show um, I think that's definitely like one one aspect why um, like retailers were recognizing it just from the aesthetic and I think from our customer um, like people who had used another product and who already like bought into the benefits of weighted blankets. They're like, they were like me. They were like, okay, this thing works. Like if I put something heavy on my body, I sleep amazing. Um, but it just makes me hot. And I think by removing that and just having a natural breathable product, we just kind of solved the core issue. And at the same time, it was sustainable. It looked beautiful. And I think the reactions on that product were immediate, where Kind of once I had that first prototype, I could feel it. I had another one before where, you know, you have to convince people to like, please try it out. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. But with this one, it was just quite the opposite where like friends I hadn't talked to in uh, years, they're like, hey, um, your product is currently sold out. Is there a way that we can get it? I'm like, OK, it's, there is like that pull versus me having to push. And I think we, we experienced it quite early on once we had uh, our core product, the Napa. Now, I imagine people are listening and saying, okay, that sounds amazing, but they're kind of wondering how an economist with no background in all this, because this is like the dream, right? The dream is find some cool product and then that you love and then start a company and become super successful at it. But, you know, the skeptic in me was like, well, you didn't know anything about blankets. So how did you get the knowledge to be able to actually reverse engineer or engineer a new type of weighted blanket successfully? It's a good point. I mean, I think at the beginning, it's just you have to um, read a lot. I mean, I was reading a lot of patents um, while I was still kind of working my full time job and was thinking basically day and night about it. And then as a next step, um, trying to find like partners like manufacturers who can help you in the process. And I think I had like a list of almost 50. So I was kind of mapping out, you know, where are like all the hubs of manufacturing where they deliver products to the U.S. And I traveled to all these countries um, to find, you know, to find someone who could could help me. And I think just going through that process and and doing it yourself and like going to these factories, talking to people, you slowly like building that knowledge. And I think starting with product knowledge was the most important thing. And then all the other buckets that I had to learn, like digital marketing, I didn't run digital marketing until like almost a year into the company because I didn't have the bandwidth to learn everything. So for me, it was like focus on the product first. I don't know anything about fabrics or manufacturing. So these are the first things I have to learn. And if I don't kind of have that basis covered, then it doesn't make sense for me to already learn about digital marketing, branding, all these other things that you need uh, for business. So I think it's just breaking it down step by step. And it's also not so overwhelming. We're like, oh, shit, I have to do eight things at the same time. It's like, no, just get the product and then figure out how you ship the product uh, once you have it in a warehouse. 
And um, yeah, and I think kind of taking it step by step helped me, uh, even though I didn't have any background in textiles. Did you ever think like, oh man, I need a, a co-founder. This is so lonely. Because uh, a lot of times I think about just keeping at it, especially when you're, for example, you said you didn't do digital marketing for a year. Some people would be completely overwhelmed at that prospect and just, you know, feel like, oh my goodness, I'm missing out. I have to do this tomorrow, but I don't know how. And then try to go find somebody to do it. Did you feel like ever the desire to like go and find a co-founder or were you comfortable just sort of taking it bit by bit and giving yourself the space? Yeah, I would have loved to have a co-founder, especially like in these in these early days um, uh, when it, digital marketing, for example, where I was, that's another like just building up a website. And I made so many mistakes also a, along the journey and getting that done. So it, it would have been great to have someone. Um, but on the other hand, I think um, if there there was not, no one naturally who I knew, because I guess also it was out of my natural network, uh, if I would have been kind of in that industry before, but none of my friends at the World Bank knew digital marketing either. So just kind of naturally, I didn't have someone. But I, what I did, though, is kind of sometimes reaching out to people like Cold on, on LinkedIn, who I knew. And even just to in the early days when I had like I needed someone to have give me some advice or consulting hours on identifying the right people. And I still do that when we hire someone. It's like, hey, I'm not the best person, for example, for SEO. But, I mean, you run your business just on SEO. Um, can you help me interview? Can you help me find the right person so I don't make these mistakes anymore? So I think um, kind of hanging along and asking for favors, um, that definitely has helped. FOMO. FOMO. I like that you cold call people on LinkedIn. I've, you know, there are, I've... Uh, I've seen really successful CEOs. I have a, a, a good friend who's the CEO of a, a company that's worth like $2 billion. Some of his best hiring was just finding the person he wanted on LinkedIn and just reaching out. And so, you know, it doesn't have to be LinkedIn, but being unafraid to ask people even a cold call for help, it's a superpower. Um, you know, it's not necessarily comfortable, but it's incredibly powerful. Now, you did something else that is very much something that, us FOMO sapiens love, which is you encourage napping at your company. And I actually did a whole uh, segment a couple months back with with one of my guests about uh, Greg McEwen um, about napping. I am I'm a I'm a napper. Mike, I don't know about you, but my sleeping during COVID got all messed up. Right, I've been a napper since I was in high school. I discovered the power of naps when I was like 16, and so I nap frequently. Um, and it's, I think it's a really powerful way of, if you don't get the sleep at night for whatever reason, just getting the sleep during the day. So I love the napping. And when I was reading about you, I read that you have instituted this culture of napping. So by the way, if you need a co-founder, I'm here for you. I'll be your co-founder <laughs> so I can take all the naps with you. But, uh, tell us, tell us about that because that's a really, I mean, it's a really interesting uh, thing you've decided to do. I mean, I'm a napper too. So I was like, it was just like I grew up in Germany and it was just part of the culture. So you come home from school and you take after your lunch, you take a nap and then you kind of get on with your day. And I think then once I kind of moved to the US and also had my first job um, and you got into like that nine to five. And it's also, you know, it's basically you're not really productive or I wasn't productive in that time. So I actually lived very close by to the to the World Bank and I was always sneaking out like on lunchtime. I'm like, I'm going quickly grabbing a salad, but then I also quickly because I lived three minutes away, <laughs> I took a 20 minutes nap and it wasn't that I was lazy, but then because I was then afterwards, I was fit. I was back on a task and I didn't kind of, you know, sit around for an hour just like surfing and browsing and and I knew I wasn't there mentally too. Um, and, and I, but I never could be open about it. So it was, there was still like that stigma around, which I think is still there. If like your nap, it's like a baby or you're being lazy. Um, so that was something where I'm like, I don't want to have in my own culture where you have to justify. Um, and I think that it's a level of like trust. If you have good people, I think they will uh, not abuse that level of trust. And it's for also it's for us, it's not really napping on a job. It's more about flexibility. I actually don't believe like on kind of like these nap rooms. I think more about it in terms of core working hours. 
So do you have like, because there's some people who want to get things done in the morning and they're incredibly productive in the morning. Um, but then um, some people just are not productive in the afternoon, but they're really productive at night. So uh, we were thinking about how can we enable like this time that we have that both that we can basically cater towards both um, kind of archetypes of people. Um, I'm the nap type, so I'm heading out, taking a nap, and then I do some additional work later on. And I think what also helped us, I mean, now we are starting uh, at 11 and then we we leave at 1.30. That's where our core working hours are. And we basically try to have all our calls within that time frame. And it also kind of sometimes you have these awkward breaks. So you're like, okay, I have another call, but I only have 30 minutes in between. So it's like it's not really enough time to get something done. So we eliminated that as well. And um, so I think it it helped us kind of being productive during when we're there, we're really present and we talk and we kind of fully engage. But then it also gives us the time to whatever we want to do before and after. And I mean, for me, it's taking the nap and being open and don't have to sneak out anymore um, around lunchtime to hide my uh, take a 20 minute nap break. So you have that period of time from 11 to 130 that everybody's on call no matter where they are in the world. And so you make sure that there's like a there's like a common time when you can communicate. But then other than that, the people are able to kind of work on their own time. And as long as they get things done, they can take all the naps they want. Is that is that how it works? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's basically how we are. I think kind of just having clear communication. So we have check ins and check outs at the end of the week. So everyone knows um, we also kind of we have like our our task mapped out so it's accessible to everyone so everyone knows what i'm working on what i want to accomplish by the end of the week and so we have that very transparently mapped out and so i think then it doesn't matter when you get your things done as long as you get those done i love that that system it's kind of awesome because it's a perfect combination of like highly structured engineered with like extraordinarily flexible all at the same time. It's like you're, you've got the German approach and then like the Southern European approach <laughs> all at the same minute, not to pick on anybody. Now, Catherine, you're very clearly a FOMO sapiens, um, which is awesome, but you're also still human and humans can get distracted. So what do you do to stay focused, you know, on that, you know, the times when you need to really be supercharging your productivity? Uh, I mean, there are a couple of things. Um, so first of all, I'm actually like I switched to getting up really early. Um, I used to be working more at late at night and I tried like a new approach where I'm getting up at five and I actually go to bed earlier. So and I think before I go to the office now, I have most of my work where I want to do some more deep thinking done already at the beginning of the day. Um, I, and I know some people like say, well, I want to sleep in, but I think I would recommend everyone to give it a try because like just that good feeling of like having kind of done some deep thinking already that's not interrupted and just blocking like these uh, two hours off where there are no calls and no one wants anything from you. Um, I get more stuff done and sometimes like during a whole work day um, that that really made a difference. And then um, you get earlier tired. So then I go home, I take a break, I, I take a nap, and then I go to bed earlier, but I kickstart my day quite early. I'll never do that, but I'm glad it works for you. <laughs> I hate going to bed early. <laughs> All right. The company is Barabee. You can find more at Barabee.com. That's B-E-A-R-A-B-Y.com. Also, you can find Barabee on socials at my Barabee. Catherine Ham, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstro. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO.